Well, I rather it's quite timely to build a bridge between what Peter was saying about things like high tech sales and our colleague from Parker, who's got the Parker gear here. Because I can bring the two together. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Robin Holland. Um, I've owned my Contessa for 32 years Thank now. Okay. There's only one person who's owned their Contessa longer, and that's John McCann, who's had the Santis. And I've raced in the solo for about, I suppose, 15, 20 years. When I first went to Cow's Week, with God knows how many years ago, there were 43 contestants on the start of was fantastic. Uh, the national championships, I think, was 34 or 35 boats. We had a fleet up on the east coast, we had a fleet up on the west coast, and the national championships was boats from all over the country coming for national championships. The national championships these days is Sean Beat and Blanco. <laughs> Three other boats. <laughs> so, and I started, a, 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 there's a debate being going on in the committees, you're probably aware, about what we do about the rig, because we got to a situation where over here were nine or ten boats becoming more and more specialised with four headsels, spending a fortune on number ones and you know, twin luffs and all so. And over here we had all the cruising boats that were going high tech, getting further reefing, that sort of stuff. And the fleets were becoming very divergent. Now, We've had a lot of technical debate in committee, which I don't particularly want to share with you, and if it does start, I'll probably kill it, because I'm not very technical. But what I kept saying to the committee, the issue for me is if we can move towards a more standard rig, where you can have a boat that you can cruise and race, it opens up a great Pandora's box of events that we can hold. For example, we want to get a lot more young people into the, into the fleet. We could hold young, you know, young skippers racing weekends. We could hold ladies' cups. I know it's a bit sexy. But once we get all the boats the same, we can do a lot of things. For example, some class associations have open days. For those that would like to try a little light racing, you know, they all come along. The experienced skippers go out. We have some gentle racing to see if people want to take to it. We are excluded from all those events at the moment because of the difference between the two rigs. And I've been pushing very, very hard. And as you probably realise, I think the association has spent... Seven and a half thousand pounds on coffee and donuts, having bloody meetings to discuss all this. <laughs> but we have at least reached a position. So what I did, there's a few more steps to go. So uh, Corofin's been out of the water for two years because I was having surgery and I couldn't sail last year. So I have worked with Peter Sanders on a sail, and I've worked with Dennis Fisher at Hamble Yacht Services Rigging, and with Jeremy and various other people. And I've put together what I think is a rig that will work for racing and cruising. I've had to make a few compromises, and I've had to give up a little bit against the frontline racing boats. Um, now, I will race with this rig for the first time this season. Um, our natural position tends to be about fifth or sixth in the fleet. So if I can maintain that and perhaps get a, you know, the odd win or something, then we've, we've got an answer. So let me quickly take you through it. Um, that's the problem. <laughs> you may recognise that off the website. That there is my Thank daughter. You. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had uh, 28 knots of wind going that way and 3.5 knots of tide going that way. Uh, that there, I can't see it, it? No, that there is the finish line of cows. So, and that was out, 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 actually out of Yachting World. It was a fantastic day. We didn't break anything. <laughs> Here is a bunch of people going cruising. And there's my daughter looking yeah. like yeah. <laughs> okay. right. Now, it was a real problem. If you've got a racing boat and you want to go cruising, you've got to take all the sails off and show them a the store. And I've talked to a number of boats that do things like Cow's Week, and it would take them a long weekend to change from one rig to another. So that's where I've been here. <coughs> Just to summarise, those are the, the old racing rules. I'm sure you recognise. We specified these four headsels. And they were very tightly specified. I'm not a sail designer. I don't understand it. But they me measure LPs and DPs and LPs and what is what other stuff. And you had to get your sail certificated with a little signature at the top saying it was going to test sail. In terms of racing in the Solent, you've really got to have a game plan from about 10 knots up to 40. Those are the conditions of racing. And at the moment, what you do is you carry your number one to about there. And the situation you get from time after time after time, you're a mile off the mark, it's blowing 20 knots, your number one's getting a bit stretchy, and all of a sudden, whack, in comes 26, 27 knots of wind, you go over on your ear and say, what do I do? Right? And the fact of the matter is those number ones stretch, and they get really totally trashed. And some of the guys at the front would say, if the wind went over 22 knots of my number wind, they'd just trade it and get a new one. It was that bad. And they really did, the performance went right down. So what do you do? Now the front boats would have twin luffs and they'd get up there with their seven crew and do a racing change and put their number two up. Um, a lot of boats couldn't do that. So you struggle to the windward marks, spilling wind and going over on your ear, and then try and change the sail going downwind. And then when you get to the top of the number two range, you get exactly the same problem again. And then you go down to your, we've got a lovely hanked on number four. And then you start playing up. <laughs> <laughs> I still love that article that Swift had. Do you remember wrote in the magazine? 
He did the Channel Race about 10 years ago, and it really blew up. <coughs> and he wrote in the magazine, the anemometer was reading 84 knots when it left the top of the mast. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so that's the problem you have. You have to pay all these sales. Now, what's actually happened? This is the problem. Okay? You couldn't change between the two. Absolutely awful. If you wanted a race, you need six or seven crew, basically. If you go back to the early days when I started, if you wanted to race a contestant and you put an advert in, you could you get a hundred volunteers and you could interview for the best, because that's what happened in those days. Keeping six or seven crew regularly racing is a nightmare. And I have a target in the end to get down to racing with four people comfortably. So we need to reduce that. And also, because you've got this cabin full of wet sails, seven people sleeping on a contester on a wet weekend is a long runner. So you end up paying for bed and breakfast, and the whole thing becomes horrendously expensive. So a whole bunch of issues. Um, and the other problem was you, you, you spend ten to 12,000 on sails to get going. And to stay anywhere in the fleet, you probably have to spend two, three, two to 3,000 pounds a year on sail replacements, just to keep in performance. Would you agree with that, Joyce? About that? You, you certainly want to replace sales fairly regularly with the old Dacron sales. So that's basically <coughs> the problem that I see. And I started this discussion about seven years ago, and it has gone on. And we've eventually just about got there. Right? So the new rule basically says you can have this high tech sale. I call it high tech. I'm not quite sure. Peter explained it this morning. <laughs> the, the key thing about the high tech sale is it doesn't stretch. So. It's counterintuitive, this, but most people don't realise it. But if your boat's going over on its ear, which it used to do with the number one, and the tiller's up here and you spin up into the wind, what you actually do is you tighten the sail in. Right? The flatter you get it, the more power you take out. So what we used to do with the number one, you wind it really tight, right hard against the shrouds, and you take the car back and let the top of the sail spin. Uh, uh, flat and it takes all the drive down. It was an absolute eyesore, you know, flat, 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 it used to trash the number one totally. But at least you could carry it in 24, 25 knots of wind and get to the mark and do something else. The thing about these high-tech sails is they don't stretch. And I talked this through with Peter, and he reckons you could probably carry this, the, the high-tech sail up to about 28, 29 knots of wind. You have to give a little bit, and I just pull it right back, take the car right back, open up the top of the sail, right? but you won't damage it. You won't stretch it, and you won't trash it. Right? And the, the, the material is so strong, you can live with that. And then if you move the car back as well, you can probably do it. So you then get the problem of what do we do up around here. <coughs> right. So the first thing is, how do I unpower that high-tech sail? And I've gone for these hard... Sorry, it's a bit dirty, but she's been ashore for two years. Well, she's been ashore for two years, the handle we got so. But as you can see, what I've done is I've taken up the, um, I've taken up the old track. <coughs> and I've put a Harken track down, and that's a ball bearing um, slide, right? and it's like silk. It's absolutely wonderful. Even under load, it just moves backwards and forwards. Right? And what I've done is I've put this the system in here, as you can see, the pulley system comes back here, it comes up through a. Uh, uh, I made you want to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That was almost prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Robin is not see. getting any commission for today. <laughs> <laughs> and over here, you see what the. This is how we also designed this. There's a, a lead down there coming back to this very clever self jamming cleat, right? And it means you can take it through that metal thing. You can take it to any winch in the cockpit if you need to pull the, the car back. But fundamentally, as soon as you get it, you just go bang like that, and the car just slides back. Right? So you can depower the sail from the cockpit. And it's a lovely, it's a lovely configuration. Right, the next problem is what do you do when you get to that sort of difficult 20, 27, 28 knots that starts playing? And as everyone says, you've got to have an inner force day. So I worked with Hamble Yacht Service and various people coming up with the best configuration. What we've come up with is this. Um, that's the inner force day there. And it goes through, and there's a, you know, there's a steel plate, stainless steel plate there. It comes right through the end of the spoon, stainless steel plate there. So it's a strong point going right through the boat. Okay? So about here you've got a strong point that goes right through to the front of the boat. And there's the stay, which lives down by the shrouds at the side. Now, I talked to you, you can pay a thousand pounds for a leave and all sorts of mechanisms. The guys that have what you got, now if you're racing, by far the best thing to do is to use a four-part tackle with a jam cleat on it. And they put a, a snap shackle there and a snap shackle there. And I was playing with it last week. You go and you grab hold of the shroud, you snap it on, you walk forward, you snap it on the deck, lean back on it like that, bang, full step. <coughs> If you then go back to the hydraulic backstay and put a couple of pumps on the hydraulic backstay, that inner stay is absolutely taut. Okay. Now, I've already got a number three and a number four which hanged. 
And it's just a question of do we go straight to the number four or straight to the number three? And we have to experiment because they're both lovely cells. And bang, I can have a, a, a hanked number three on there and done. Now, the downside at that stage, of course, is the, the high tech cell will be furled around the furler. And so in front of the sail, I'm going to have a, a rolled sail. And I've talked to Peter about this. He says, to be quite honest with you, that at 28, 29 knots of wind, it's not going to make a lot of difference. It will disturb the airflow a bit. But it's not going to affect you unless you're right, right up on the bankers' <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure we need to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I resent that. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, now, the, the next dilemma was that, let's say, the rule state that you, you've got a bit of 140 would have up there. The trouble is the space they left with the rule only allows you to put the drum right down at the bottom. You couldn't get the anchor out. So I had to make a compromise. And I decided that no cruising boat in the world is going to go cruising without being able to put its anchor out. And people were suggesting things like put a fair lead on the side of the boat. And so I said, no, 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 no. This has to be a cruiser racing rig. So I worked with Hamble Yacht Services and everybody else. And we've positioned the drum so that you can just get the anchor chain out there without doing any damage. The consequence of this is Peter Sanders has had to build me a sail. And I've had to give up about an inch and a quarter or an inch and a half at the foot of the sail. And he believes that, except in the lightest of airs, you know, it's not going to make that much difference. Um, and as you know, the rule, the rule was that it had to be 32 square metres. And I've gone through the full 32 square metres, which means, if I understand it, the sail will come a bit further back. But I'll still have the full power. But it means that now, if it starts to blow up, I can just wind in the high-tech sail. OK, bang, I can get the number three up and sail in heavy winds. And also, it makes spinner handling easier. So now, the, the foredeck don't have to worry about dragging the, the, the number one down. Because right, when we're going to put around the corner and put the kite up, the cockpit can be winding in the high tech sail while the spinnaker guys are working on the, on, the, on the kite. So we should be able to race with four people by doing that. Um, when you use your anchor, do you carry it forward and drop it and it's just the chain? It's that's only the chain will fit under there. Yes. Right. Now, when, when we're racing, we are obliged to carry it. No, we are obliged to carry an anchor. Down below. I, ke I keep it down below. Yes. Um, yes. What I do is I've got a strop on it so I can get it on quickly. And if we were light handed, I make sure all the bunks are up so I can get it up through the hatch. Are you allowed to carry it down below? Yeah. The only through. rule is you've got to carry it in front of the, the um, bulkhead, <laughs> yeah. in front of the toilet. Uh, <laughs> what I do is in there, I keep a little tiny baby eight pound kedge anchor in case we need to kedge in light airs or something like that. Yeah, it is a compromise. You ain't going to be able to carry a, a great big shanked anchor over the front. So you'd have to put the chain through and Sort of but and it you seems have a me, roller. You have a roller. Oh, on your yeah. Bar. It's a perfectly so standard it's compression. Standard, yes. Yeah. The real problem was that, that where, when you had the drum down low, yeah. the, the chain just yes. trashed it. Yes. And there we have a happy crew of four. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the position man, I haven't actually taken delivery of myself from Peter yet. So I got the rig sorted out first, and he went and measured it. And his, uh, the sail's now ready for collection. Um, I was playing with the rig last week down at Howell Yacht, so it's, it's all ready to go. My lovely daughter is putting together the crew, and we're going to go out and race for that configuration next year. It'll be very interesting to see how it performs. Now, if it does perform well, then I hope we've got the basis of a configuration that we could all move to. You know, it's going to require a slight adjustment to the sail plan and things like that. And then, if you want to come racing, you either come along with your existing firm and try it, but the only investment you have to make on is a high tech sail. And if you want to race and cruise, you may, want to, you may not want to cruise with your high tech sail. Because I've, I've still got a 25-year-old heavy-duty furler that I had when I first bought Coralfin sitting in my cellar. And it will take, what, two minutes to take the old sail down and put the new one up? So I think we've got the basis here of a boat that can work either way. And the only sails I have to carry on board are a spinnaker, which can go under a bunk, and a number four. So I stop there, because there's lots and lots of implications to this. Um, but I decided we'd talk for long enough, and that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> How expensive will this sail be, roughly? Um, <laughs> the sail or the full the, the, uh, uh, the, the high tech, uh, the one Peter built me, I think, was... Yeah, it's about 1900, 2000. 2000. So there are options, but I, what I said to Peter, I got the rig sorted out first with Hamble Yacht Services and all the anchoring problems and everything else, and I said to Peter, design me the best racing sail you can that will fit on that boat. And I left it entirely up to him. And when he started doing wefting and weaving, I went down the pub. <laughs> <laughs> but your plate on which you put your inner forestay, was that added? Oh, yes, sorry, that was added, yes. That was added by the RTM. By the RTM, yeah. But as I yes. say, it, because the... 
the strong you box. can do it so you yeah, can so go straight through there yes. so it, it, the anchor locker is is there so it's yeah. forward of the anchor locker yeah in fact i think they drill the hole in that plate there the and they drill straight through yes right and then they put a, a thing through yes. there's, a, there's a steel bolt yes. and, a, and a load spreader yeah. so it's really really strong yeah. robin did you consider putting the inner force bay above the, the anchor well well that's the standard thing if you just want safety what I was trying to get to is a boat, because you know we have to race with number threes. Yeah. So I was, and I talked again, I talked to Peter and everybody else, how far back does that have to be mm. to allow the space for mm. that? And the general view was that if you do that, of course, the, when the sail is furled, it's going to be about there. Yeah. So you're going to have a gap about that big with the hanged number three. And I think in 28 to 34 knots of wind, I'll be very surprised if you notice the difference. You'll be hitting six foot waves and going sideways. So, shall I stop there, because there are other, other speakers, and hopefully I've, I've put a marker in the ground for the season, the next season. Well, not, not really, because can you furl your head stall and still race? You know, yeah, half, yeah, furl, yeah. No, take four furls then, I mean. Oh, sorry, yeah, good point. Um, I, again, I talked to Peter about this. If you, you've got the big high-tech sail up and you've taken the car back and it's still putting it over on your ear, he says you can put two or three turns in the front of the sail, and it will get you to the mark, it will take all the power out of the zone, but it won't be very pretty. But you can reduce it to a size two or slightly less. He says two or three more. About 50 centimetres. Yeah. And he said he well, had reinforced the bit him, to which he Careful, we're going down a slightly different route. The, the idea is to have a rig. Okay. Okay. Now, if you're going to go cruising, you may want to change your racing yes. furler for a cruising furler. My cruising furler gets heavier on, as it goes back, and I can take it right down to a number three. It's a wonderful cruising sail, but I wouldn't race with it. What I'm after here is a, a standard mm. configuration with me. So with mm. this, the only difference between a racing boat and a cruising boat is which sail they fly. Mm. That's what I was reading. Sorry, is that sort of? <laughs> I still so have, have, have a, a, I still have a racing. Yes. Uh, well, bear in mind that the, what they did was what you've got to remember is that the purpose of this was to allow people to have a furlough on it. There's nothing in the rules I about a furlough on it. I, I just changed the, the rules. The rules say nothing point. about a furlough. Right? Now, Blanco doesn't have a furlough. She has a racing luff up there, but she is obliged now to leave a space there. So whether you actually carry a furlough or not is a matter of complete irrelevance. Right? Now, if Blanco had a furlough, I suspect what they would still do is they'd put the thing up the slot, take it down, and do the racing changes they cut. Because so the furlough, to a certain extent, is a complete red herring. Now, I want to race with four, and I love Jessica to go cruising, because the problem I've got at the moment is I've got four sails that hang on, and if the two of us want to go off on our own, we we'll take it start. Now, with this, all right, Jess can take her friends and stick up the, the you know, cruising thing and go across the trunks. So that, that was what I was after. I was trying to get that standard hardware configuration that everybody could live with. Can I, um, may I just add my, <coughs> my thoughts and experience, just for the benefit of everyone? Um, so, uh, in 2010, uh, I was going down exactly this route, um, partly because uh, I wanted to do more cruising with my family rather than racing, and also because I was planning to go off to the Azores and go a, a silly long way in a small boat, but very wet. Um, but uh, I had a, uh, a laminate sail built by Peter. Um, it's slightly smaller than the maximum size we're now allowed for racing, but uh, what I now have is, is, is a boat with a, a furler and in a four stay and I, uh, I go cruising it with my family and I go racing with it uh, with four or five or however many crew I can get and I actually use the same sail for both. I went for a, a lower <coughs> end of the technology spectrum. Yours are 28 spectrum. square metres. Yeah, so mine's a bit smaller than the standard size, but I did that because I was planning to go offshore with it. Um, but it's only a Pentex laminate, it's not a fancy Technora carbon blah de blah de blah. It's at the lower end of the spectrum, but um, it's still competitive. Um, you know, I, I actually won my first Contessa race with it last year, with only four crew, using my uh, furling laminate sail on a furl. So, you know, you can go out and do it, and you can have a sail that will work in both cruising and racing modes. I know Rick, uh, Robin's primarily a racing man, I know he wants to do some cruising, but... Uh, uh, yeah, that's why you've gone for a, a, a fairly oh. high-end sail well, from Peter, but you can, you can Because we have a there. cruising sail as well. Yes, so yeah, exactly. We have I have very strong feelings about the association I've been a member for 20 or 30 years. Most of my best friends are contested sailors. Some of the social events we've had have been absolutely fantastic. And I was just getting a little bit hacked off that we were just drifting apart into two camps, which I thought was entirely wrong. So my driver has not been technical. It's been more about coming back like that. Now, we didn't understand these high-tech sails four or five years ago. We weren't quite sure how to do it. Um, but I went out 
and sailed on Gigi at the Nationals and got a feel for it. I've talked to lots of people. And in the early days, the high-tech sails were pretty trash. They were grey and you couldn't fold them. And, but now we've got to a point where you can have a nice white high-tech sail that performs and this sort of thing. So it's taken a while to get there. But I think now the technologies and the first things are there that we can actually come back together <coughs> as a single fleet. And I would love to start doing things like Young People's Weekends and Open Days and Team Racing and all the things that we used to do. Shall I stop there? A dangerous <laughs> thing, but hopefully I've fired off some thoughts and we can debate about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.